And now, from Washington, the inside scoop. All the news the government does not want you to hear. Virginia, I'm George Barker. I'm your guest host for this evening. George Burke could not be here today. We're doing our program tonight in two parts. The first part will focus on the living wage. With me tonight is Clayton Sinyai. Clayton, can you introduce yourself? Hi. Thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm Clayton Sinyai, Chairman of the Campaign for a Living Wage. Clayton, can you tell us what is a living wage? I'm sure people who've uh, been following things in the newspapers and on the media over the last couple of years have heard something about it, but can you t tell us what is a living wage and what's the campaign? Well, the idea behind the living wage is something that's uh, been picked up all over the metro D.C. area and, and across the country. Uh, the idea is uh, primarily attached to uh, public contracts and uh, public employees in different jurisdictions, cities and counties. And, and what the living wage idea says is everybody who is doing uh, work for us, uh, the taxpayers, ought to be paid a wage sufficient so that they don't have to turn to uh, public chair to uh, public welfare or private charity in order to make ends meet. So in other words, we should be paying them what they're worth on the front end in terms of their employment rather than trying to help subsidize it through the back end through other types of support services because we aren't paying them enough to be able to survive. Exactly. Uh, we think that no one who, uh, no one who works for a living uh, should still be in poverty and uh, that should especially be true of the people who work for us uh, in the public sector in the public sector or paid for by public dollars in some way. So. Precisely. Yes. All right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how we got started in Virginia, and particularly the experience in Alexandria, where I think things started in terms of a living wage locally? Uh, it did. Alexandria was the first jurisdiction in the metro D.C. area to adopt the living wage. Uh, it happened uh, in 1999. Uh, this campaign brought together uh, church groups, community groups, labor organizations, and others in the community who said, well, we think we get uh, better quality public services when, the pe when we uh, insist that contractors who are working for the city of Alexandria who are cleaning our public buildings and, and cutting the grass in our public areas uh, are receiving a living wage. We think uh, this helps, them, helps retain the best quality employees uh, and, and uh, encourages companies to invest in and the and the and the uh, city to invest in training when that was first proposed in Alexandria what type of concerns or resistance or questions did people have about it well it's it was surprising uh, because it, the the depth of support for the living wage idea is surprising it, it tends to cross all kinds of boundaries everyone thinks that if you work full-time you deserve a wage that can support a family so a, a lot of uh, uh, people on whether Republican or Democrat tended to support the living wage idea. Uh, there were some community organizations, there were some uh, business organizations that were concerned uh, that it would uh, raise the cost of doing business in the city uh, and there were also some that feared a spillover effect into, into the private sector. The living wage only applies to uh, public, uh, public services, whether they were provided by contract or, or, or uh, by the city itself. So it wasn't like a minimum wage. It wasn't something that applied to everybody who did business in the city, only those people who had a contract with city government. Precisely. It's only people who are getting taxpayer dollars were affected. And in fact, in, in Alexandria, it doesn't cover city employees directly. It simply covers uh, uh, empl uh, employees of contractors who work with the city. Right. Um, the rest of the businesses in Alexandria are not affected, but some of them feared uh, that they would have to compete with the vendors uh, with the city for uh, the vendors who are providing services to the city for the same workers and and they objected right I think that's a it's good to understand the distinction between what's a living wage and what's a minimum wage uh, because I, I think everybody's very familiar with a minimum wage but not everybody's been familiar with the living wage concept uh, once Alexandria enacted that the living wage ordinance in the city uh, what were the effects of it and what was their experience with it, with the living wage uh, they saw the the uh, City council members in Alexandria who we spoke with uh, reported uh, uh, a slight increase in the cost of contracts and a, and a significant increase in the quality of services delivered. They saw that the employees who were once receiving a minimum wage, who, who had once been receiving a minimum wage, uh, these employees had had rapid turnover. If right. a person was making 5.15 an hour, um, which until recently was the minimum wage, 
uh, if they got a better job opportunity, they just didn't show up for work the next day. And, right. and that showed up in poor quality services for the city. Now, uh, after the living wage was passed, those kinds of things didn't happen. They saw the same employees doing the same jobs for years and years uh, and uh, were providing much better services to the residents of the city. And yeah, certainly what I understood Stan, is, is consistent with that, that uh, you know, the, what some people had feared initially was that there would be a significant increase in cost to the city with no uh, demonstrable benefit in terms of the services. But what they saw was two things. One was the quality of services that were provided. The other was the reduced turnover and, in effect, the commitment of people to their job and sort of doing the extra little things that made a difference there. Uh, and that's part of what made it something that the cities maintain a strong support for over time. Precisely. I, I understand that recently uh, Montgomery County, which was the next jurisdiction in the Metro DC area, Montgomery County, Maryland, right. uh, just did a, uh, a study of the effect on their budget and found that uh, something on the order of one-tenth of one percent was the cost factor that came in uh, after they imposed a It was a actually a very small, small, very small effect upon cost, but a right. significant benefit in terms of quality and, and reduced turnover. Precisely. That was their experience. Right. Uh, as I understand it, then Arlington County became the next jurisdiction in uh, Northern Virginia area uh, to enact a living wage. Uh, how did that compare with the Alexandria experience? It did. Uh, Alexand or Arlington uh, moved forward in, in the wake of Alexandria's decision, again moved by a large outpouring of support for the community asking the asking Arlington to adopt the same thing. Many church groups, many labor organizations, many community organizations, uh, and, and many citizens of all walks of life came to their, uh, when they heard about what was happening in Alexandria, right. asked the board members of Arlington. Ar Arlington did them uh, one better in, in many respects by adopting a living wage that applied uh, both to direct county employees as well as contract vendors who right. were working with the county. Pretty right. much everybody who was getting uh, uh, getting paid uh, uh, on the taxpayer's dime right. was going to be guaranteed a living wage so that they wouldn't be coming back to the county asking for subsidized public services of one kind or another. Right. Uh, what are the wage rates that are, uh, the minimum wage rates that are negotiated as part of these uh, contracts then in Arlington and Alexandria now, and how does that compare to the minimum wage law that exists in, uh, nationally and in Virginia? Um, the living wage laws all over uh, uh, the metro DC area have tended to be in the uh, uh, between eleven and thirteen dollars per hour. Uh, currently, uh, there's a twelve seventy five dollar an hour living wage in Alexandria. Uh, I believe, uh, as of last year, eleven eighty was the uh, Arlington wage uh, um, living wage level, um, which is due for uh, adjustment uh, shortly for a cost of living. Uh, matter. Uh, they, d it really depends on how it's how it's originated and how it's indexed. Right. Now, in the case of uh, Alexandria, they took the poverty level basically, mm -hmm. and they wanted to make sure that no one was uh, receiving a poverty level wage. Uh, in the case of Arlington, they took a, a fairly uh, widely respected study by Wider Opportunities for Women, uh, which had developed a bare bones budget for living in each of the counties and cities of the DC metro area. Right. And they determined uh, the level of the, of the living wage uh, for Arlington using that number and then proposed indexing it thereafter, although uh, it wasn't automatically indexed and that's why it's fallen a little bit behind the uh, Alexandria number. Right. So those rates are about twice what the minimum wage uh, law has been. Precisely. Right, so. the, the minimum wage uh, has been $5.15 an hour for, for years. It's just been raised, thank goodness, to five eighty five. But you're still talking less than uh, uh, an annual salary of less than $12,000 a year for a full-time right. worker. Right. Um, and in contrast, uh, the living wage is intended... The living wage and a living wage of eleven or twelve dollars an hour uh, is is now bringing employees up to twenty four or twenty five thousand dollars a year in in salary, perhaps not quite enough to live in in our rather expensive area, but uh, a lot closer to the cost of right. living than uh, the ten to twelve thousand dollars a year. That so it's still not but it's still not wage. luxury living given the housing costs here in Northern Virginia, but it does provide people much better opportunity to be able to support the family fully. In, Absolutely, in situations. Um, now, I know there's been a campaign in Fairfax County for a couple of years to try to pursue this issue. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what the effort has been and sort of where things stand at this point? Sure. Uh, the Campaign for a Living Wage uh, came together about two years ago to pursue living wage policies across Northern Virginia. Um, whether they have to do, uh, 
uh, wage justice uh, across Northern Virginia, whether it have to do with uh, the minimum wage or the living wage. Uh, this brought together once again uh, a large number of uh, church congregations, uh, of community groups, and of labor organizations, and individuals who were uh, concerned about good government in the in, in the different counties. Um, one of the first campaigns we adopted was to try to persuade uh, Fairfax County to adopt a similar living wage ordinance as Arlington and Alexandria already had, and uh, we have been campaigning for about two years now uh, for right. that. And uh, the other day we had a breakthrough where uh, Fairfax County, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors uh, unanimously voted to take the plunge and adopt a living wage ordinance. Uh, the living wage ordinance in this case covers direct county employees. All right, well that's certainly you know, a significant step for Fairfax County to join Arlington and Alexandria, at least in some respects, in terms of having a living wage. Uh, as part of its policy, for at least in this case, for county employees, it, it was a big step and, and an important one. Uh, first of all, as a as a citizen and resident of, of Fairfax County, I'm certainly glad that we're no longer competing at a disadvantage for the best quality uh, right. uh, public workers in in the area. Um, Fairfax County actually, uh, in adopting their living wage ordinance, uh, adopt decided to adopt the higher of the two. They, they said they would base theirs on the higher of the two, Arlington or Alexandria, um, right. which in this case is Alexandria. But the, the point there for me as a resident of, Fair, of Fairfax is uh, we are matching, uh, in matching the wages available in nearby jurisdictions, and we're not competing at a disadvantage for uh, good quality workers. Right. Um, in addition, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors made a very important point by indicating that uh, this was not simply a quality of public services issue, although it is that, right. and it wasn't only a uh, moral issue, although it is that. It was also a transportation and a planning and an environmental issue. Uh, workers who are receiving a minimum wage can't afford to live where they work, and right. that means they are choking the roads every day, coming in from uh, other counties uh, driving in or from states. who knows how far away, right. or states in right. many cases. They could be driving in uh, from, West from West Virginia, right. a lot of them are, uh, or central Pennsylvania or what have you. So uh, this meant uh, fewer people on the roads, uh, less traffic, and, and those kinds of issues. And, and living wage policies are going to be part of the solution for our, our transportation and uh, environmental needs in, in this area. Yeah, if we end up with a situation where all our county employees are living outside Fairfax County, all it is doing is, is in effect exacerbating the problem that we have in terms of transportation and other types of services locally here. One other thing that I think has been interesting is to see the responses of some of the businesses uh, that have been affected in Arlington and Alexandria with the living wage and talked about how this has helped them in terms of improving their quality of their workforce and leaving them in a position where they can provide the, that salary level without feeling that they were a competitive disadvantage for getting county or city contracts. Exactly. Uh, many of the uh, uh, businesses that were uh, per that are performing contracts uh, in Ar Arlington or Alexandria and were initially hesitant uh, spoke up very loudly in defense of the policy when some folks in the legislature wanted to take away the authority of counties and cities by right. law uh, to to enact these kinds of policies. And they said, "Look, you know, this is the only thing that enables me to attract and retain quality employees. This is what allows me to invest in training and skills upgrades. If right. I have to compete against the guy who's go who's going to pay the lowest dollar, I'm not going to be able to do those things, right. and I'm going to deliver inferior services." Right. Right. All right, well, thank you for all this background on it. Well, we're going to have to take a uh, short break here in just a, a few seconds. What I want to do is have those of you who are out there, if you have questions, call in. The number is 571 749 1166. On the floor. I was a cowboy. Bang, 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 bang. I said, Jenny, wake up, wake up. It's just pretend. But she wouldn't wake up. Jay, don't forget your helmet. Will do. Your bike helmet. Oh, okay. Hi, 
I'm James Thrash with the Washington Redskins. On the football field, a helmet is an important piece of equipment. I also wear another helmet that's just as important. A bike helmet. It's the most important piece of equipment you'll have the next time you're out on your bike. Wear yours and make sure your kids do too. Safety first with the skins. Oh, hey mister, studied algebra in school and got a better job than I could. You take the last call. Oh, no, 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 mister, stuck in an entry level job because you only learned basic math. I don't have a boss riding my butt like you do, so you take it so you can get back to your desk. <laughs> you know, I probably should, but maybe Miss AP Calculus with the $200 haircut in the big office upstairs would like a cup. Oh no, mister, what was your name again? Never mind, it doesn't matter. I'm too busy doing important things to care. I just came down for some sweet and stir. <laughs> You know, if my limited math abilities weren't keeping me from getting a better job, I'd quit this afternoon. I don't blame you. But thank goodness you're stuck here because we really need someone to make the coffee. <laughs> We're talking about the living wage this evening right now. Uh, and thank, for, thank, for, thank you for uh, tuning into our program. If you want to call in with a question, you can call in at 571-749-1166. We do have a question that was emailed in. And that question is to you, Clayton. Uh, it states that the current Wider Opportunities Women uh, wage uh, rate that's talked about is $15.29 per hour, but the Fairfax County decision was at $12.75 per hour. Can you talk about why the difference between the two figures? Yes. Uh, the $15.29 per hour number is actually something uh, we calculated, we at the Campaign for a Living Wage calculated based on the uh, uh, Wider Opportunities for Women study of 2005. Uh, back in 2005, Wider Opportunities for Women went back and looked at the list of items from their budget in the, uh, the, the bare bones budget they developed back in 1999 and uh, readjusted it based on the numbers uh, that were current uh, for food, uh, for transportation, for child care, and especially the cost of housing. And they found that costs had gone up so high, uh, for, uh, costs had gone up so fast for uh, housing in the metro D.C. area that uh, the that the, it had exceeded the rate of inflation, and uh, something like fifteen dollars twenty nine cents per hour is what was necessary uh, to support yourself and not be eligible and and needing uh, private charity uh, going to uh, whether applying for public benefits or or going to uh, uh, church uh, food kitchens or what have you. Um, Fairfax County uh, looked at this looked at this number. Uh, however, they decided for their first step they were going to uh, stay in line with the surrounding jurisdictions. They adopted, uh, although they haven't worked out the details yet, um, they adopted, as I mentioned before, the higher of the two uh, wages determined by Arlington and Alexandria, uh, which is sufficient for uh, keeping, keeping them competitive for the best workers. Uh, we are certainly hoping that uh, all three jurisdictions will be taking a look in the future at uh, whether $24,000 a year is actually what we should be using today as a standard of self-sufficiency for Northern Virginia, which has become a very expensive place to live. Yeah. Well, certainly given housing costs in our area, uh, it's important to, to regularly update and look at these types of figures to determine what is reasonable and what are the minimums that are appropriate for our area. And obviously housing costs are probably the major thing that drives this issue as it relates to Northern Virginia. Uh, is that sort of, is that a fair assumption as to sort of what are the differences over time and why it's important to, to continually evaluate the, uh, the living wage. It is. That was the major cost that jumped. Uh, and, and in fairness, we haven't looked at, we don't have a, a good number uh, for uh, since uh, 2005. Uh, housing costs have not escalated quite as fast. Uh, what we need to do is go back and, and look at what, uh, figure out a realistic number for how much it does cost to live here uh, and, and uh, think about Applying that to our uh, both our uh, for our, both our public employees and our public contracts. Right. Yeah. Certainly, housing costs are a big issue, and housing costs increased very rapidly in the early part of this decade. The last couple of years, they've not increased as fast. So it's something that is not going to increase at a steady rate, and we need to continually assess and evaluate things to make sure that we're keeping up with what the real impacts are upon the people who are affected by this. 
Sure. I, I thought it was very important that uh, the county had looked at this as part of uh, the transportation, but also the affordable housing issue. Uh, we do go to uh, developers uh, who are coming into the county, and we expect them to uh, offer uh, some affordable ha housing units when they're when they're uh, offering a new development. This is kind of the other side of the affordable housing, uh, uh, the other end to approach affordable housing for. Uh, from uh, you need uh, housing that's uh, affordable. You need housing that's uh, affordable for working families, but nothing is going to be affordable if you're making ten thousand dollars a year. Uh, not in not in Fairfax County. You also need to have living wage jobs. Uh, it's it's great that the county is doing this on behalf of not just this but other categories of employees. We're looking at uh, workforce housing and things like that. Um, perhaps also we should begin to ask uh, developers who are coming into the community. Uh, if they are going to assure that the jobs they're bringing in, whether they're construction jobs or whether they are uh, uh, retail jobs, are living wage jobs, or are they going to create a bigger burden on our transportation system and our and our housing networks? Yeah, those are certainly uh, critical issues here. And when the county is doing what it can to try to ensure that people who are moderate income have affordable housing, uh, it's doing two major things. One is the county has its affordable housing program affordable dwelling unit program that in effect requires developers to uh, have 10 percent of the units that is affordable for people who are modest income. But the county is also putting a penny on the tax rate uh, to preserving and developing additional affordable housing. Uh, if we have people who are, have jobs and are getting adequate pay, we're going to need a lot less of that over time. And so we actually can reduce the burden upon the taxpayers in terms of uh, providing that affordable housing to help some people be able to work in the local community here. Uh, so it's, this type of legislation certainly has a lot of benefits, short term and long term. Certainly, um, the county also took the step in their in their resolution. Although it's not legally binding, they took the step of asking or uh, encouraging and exhorting all. Um, first of all, all vendors who are doing business with the county, uh, although they haven't been uh, required to yet, they have been uh, uh, encouraged to follow the county's policy. Uh, they have also uh, encouraged all businesses, all firms doing business in Fairfax County to adopt a living wage standard. Again, this is sending the signal that we want Fairfax County to be the kind of place where uh, we're attracting job, living wage jobs, bringing living wage jobs to the community because we know that's better for everybody. It's better for our transportation situation. It's better for our housing situation. Uh, it's better for the quality of opportunities that our children are going to have when they grow up. Right. Um, given that the county has just passed this and it hasn't gotten fully into effect yet, do you have an idea as to how many county employees will be affected by this and will, will benefit from this in the short run? Well, uh, the best estimates that have already been offered uh, are we're only speaking about covering uh, dozens rather than hundreds of right. employees. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to, I, I, think, I think the county is, is, this is an experiment. The county is right. going to want to see, uh, does this have the effect on quality of services that they're expecting? Right. Uh, having seen that and, and had that ex having the same experience they have in Alexandria and Arlington, I'm, we're looking forward to seeing them uh, step up and cover additional categories of employees. Right. Um, will this cover just uh, county government employees or will it also cover school system employees? Well, school system employees aren't directly uh, covered by this ordinance, uh, it's my understanding. Uh, that's another area that uh, is sure to be brought up. Uh, a lot of uh, the teacher's aides uh, have been suggesting that, or have been, have been coming to me and, and telling, telling me that they actually would have fallen below the living wage uh, according to the level of 1529 that we had proposed right. earlier, and that uh, we certainly, uh, in Fairfax County, pride ourselves on having uh, the best public schools uh, uh, in the in some of the best public schools in the nation. And uh, uh, but we also appreciate that you have to pay for that, and uh, we do want to have our, our the best teachers' aides in those classrooms. Right. Uh, as I understand, it, I think there are one or two jurisdictions in the state where the school system has adopted this type of policy as well. So that this is something that certainly would be an option for, you know, for them as, uh, in addition to the, what the county government itself has done. They have indeed. Some of the, some of the counties in, in the, uh, uh, some of the school boards in different counties in Virginia have adopted this and uh, that's one of the reasons why they've been inspired to, to bring that uh, effort to Fairfax County. 
uh, will this apply to, does this apply to part-time employees as well as to full-time or does it apply to only full-time or who, which employees are covered and which are the, what types of employees are not covered by this legislation? Uh, this was aimed primarily at full-time employees and that's who's going to be covered. Um, uh, there are a lot of part-time employees in, in, for the county who might not necessarily have the same case, uh, um, uh, children employed uh, in summer camps in the park systems that are not supporting families and they probably don't need uh, necessarily the same kinds of protections that uh, a lot of uh, these employees uh, who are uh, uh, career employees do. Is it safe to say from your perspective the county is sort of getting its foot wet by trying this with its county employees and then there, there's potential for looking at other options as it relates to contract or school system or other types of employees uh, uh, later on once you see how this works uh, with the direct county employees? That's what we're hoping. Um, we, the, the school system employees are, are one group. Uh, limited term employees are another. There are a large number of employees on the county payroll who are not officially career employees, but many of them uh, are contracted with over and over to perform similar jobs. And uh, those folks uh, need the same kind of protection. And they're working a full 40 hours a week or whatever, so it's not as if they're just a part-time employee. Precisely. Um, they are considered, they're, they're registered as temporary employees or limited term, uh, but frequently they're uh, renewed over and over again. They're working full time, doing county work, uh, and they're performing services that we depend on. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, are, are you looking at expanding this to, extending this to, uh, try to extend this to other jurisdictions, to Prince William and Loudoun or Falls Church and Fairfax City, other jurisdictions that are not covered I've, by this yet? So I've been fielding an awful lot of calls from uh, community leaders in, uh, Fair in Loudoun County and Prince William County who are interested in finding out what we did in Fairfax and how they can bring it to their communities. Uh, all the jurisdictions in Virginia look up to what happens in Fairfax County, so what right. happened here was very important. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've certainly found is once you get something like this in one jurisdiction, other jurisdictions suddenly start taking a little interest in it and want to see how it's worked there. Uh, what issues there may be with it and is something they want to do or if they want to do it, they do they want to do it any differently. Uh, so I'd expect that you will have continue to get those types of calls as, as other people try to explore their options in their jurisdictions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, for us, our, our immediate future is that uh, the county board, the board of supervisors is working out next month, uh, early September, exactly how this is going to be implemented and who's going to be covered. Uh, but. We're excited nonetheless, and uh, we're actually holding a, a large uh, celebration. We'll be holding a picnic uh, to celebrate the adoption of living wage in uh, Mason District Park uh, between uh, 12 and 2 sep on Saturday, September 8th. And everyone in the public is invited. Uh, come on down. We'll invite the uh, whole Board of Supervisors to pat Good. them on the back and thank them for taking this step forward. Yes. Well, it's nice to say they agreed and, and didn't pass it in an unanimous fashion here. So It's wonderful. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Clayton. I appreciate your being here and filling us in on the living wage, and we appreciate your, your helping out on things. Pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Some people in Fairfax County don't know what public access means. Some think it's just another channel on the dial. But it's much more than that. It's the voice of the people. People like you. Your neighbors. Your friends. Or your family. People who want to share ideas, opinions, cultures, lifestyles, art, sports, music, events, entertainment, history, science, beliefs, people who want to learn about television, producing, directing, cameras, audio, lighting, editing, or radio, talk, music, whatever you think people should hear. Public access is the place where everyone has a voice. And it's the place where that voice gets heard. A place where you can create your own form of personal expression. So what do you want to say? Whatever it is. You can say it here. Because we're public access. For the people. By the people. It is about balancing our choices between the gray of the concrete jungle and the stunning beauty of the real one between a stoic facade of granite and the fury of the canyon. It's why there's Earthshare, the simple way to find balance. Earthshare is the workplace giving program bringing the leading environmental groups under one umbrella. Support Earthshare, support them all. Earthshare, please ask your employer about workplace giving. To learn more, visit our website.
Thousands of kids in this country have everything it takes to go to college. Except the money. The United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop, Virginia. As I stated earlier, I'm George Barker, your guest host uh, today. Uh, with me on this half hour of the program is Vincent Cody uh, with the Communication Workers of America. Vincent, could you introduce yourself? And Sure. Uh, I'm Vincent Cody. I'm Executive Vice President of Local 2222. Local 2222 is uh, based in Annandale, Virginia. Uh, we cover all the way out to Winchester and all the way down to Orange, Virginia, Orange County, um, Louisa, and all of Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax yeah, County. Yeah. We have about 2,000 members of our local, and we mostly do uh, take care of Verizon, but we service nine other contracts. Okay, and what type of work do these uh, employees do, the, the people who are work, members of the communication workers? Well, we do everything from work in the business office and take your calls for service and installation right. orders. Um, we have all the technicians out in the field, whether they're linemen that go put up the lines or uh, cable maintenance people that take care of the lines, installers that do inside work. We also have the Fios installers that do the new fiber optic to the house. Uh, I am what's called a system technician, and I'm my, my, as my telephone company job, I work in Warrington as a system technician, mm -hmm. and we take care of special circuits and 911 and that, that sort of thing. All right, good. I uh, want to talk today about broadband access, and uh, obviously it's an issue that a lot of people have, but I think it's something that particularly is, is relevant to the people who are members of the communication workers and that you're involved in helping to provide that service to us. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what some of the issues are in terms of people having access to broadband? capabilities. I'd love to. Um, in, in Virginia and in the United States, we are lagging behind the rest of the world in access to broadband technologies. Uh, CWA believes that that's bad. It's bad for Virginia, it's bad for the United States. You know, this is, this is stuff that we should already have. I think, depending upon what survey you look at, we're anywhere from 25 to 35 in the nation as far as in us, in, I'm sorry, in the world. Right. Uh, as far as speed and uh, the uh, accessibility to the general population. Um, in Virginia, we have the rural areas right now that are pretty much without. And then we've got the Northern Virginia area that's got um, some choice. Uh, it's still growing. Uh, Verizon is in the Fios, and they're covering more and more areas. Um, and of course, you've got the cable companies, some other some other people right. that are in the business, but um, a lot of them don't provide basic dial tone service either. So um, we're interested in, in in coming forth with a plan in Virginia and in the nation to speed that along, right. so that no matter where you live in Virginia, you have an opportunity for broadband access. When you use the word broadband, can you tell us what types of technology you're talking about there that, that uh, comprise broadband? Well, you've got the cable TV and modems, uh, you've got DSL technologies, and you've got the Fios technology, you've got fiber optic. Uh, some people can actually get the broadband off a satellite dish, but that's a little more expensive and you know, it's harder to get, especially if you live you know, in the rural areas where you live in the mountains and there's trees and right. stuff in the way. So for most people, it's either they have access through a cable system, um, such as our cable system here in Fairfax, or they have access through DSL, mm -hmm. uh, through the phone company right, and their, their phone service, or now increasingly, uh, at least in some urban areas, there's more of the Fios uh, type of technology that's available. That is absolutely right. And, um, you know, when, when you live in one part of Virginia and you have three or four choices as to what you can do, right. but you live in another part of Virginia and you really, you have dial-up. Right. I mean, dial-up is just not an option anymore for people. Um, you know, you go, you download a home page and go out and cut your grass and come back and, you know, see if it's there yet. Right. So. Uh, when you talk about uh, the U.S. being somewhere between 20 and 25 in terms of ranking in, in the world, you're talking about in terms of the number of people who actually use broadband or the number of people have access to broadband or what's the comparison? Uh, the uh, number of people actually have access to broadband and the speeds. And the speeds. Uh, many other nations have much higher speeds on uploading and downloading the uh, data. But one of the issues, as I understand it, is that there are a lot of people who simply do not have access to any of the types of technologies that you're talking about. Uh, absolutely. And are sort of left with dial-up as the only option they have for uh, 
Okay. Right, because it's not in the in the interest of the businesses, whether they be Verizon or the cable companies or whoever, to string those lines and put up all that and, and hopefully to get the, the 20 or 30 or 100 people that may subscribe by putting up 10 or 15 right. miles of lines. And, and our position, though, is, you know, when we built the, the railroads or the highways, uh, the nation and the, and, and the individual states all said, you know, this is in our best interest um, to do this. So I think what we have to do is encourage a partnership between all the players um, to make sure that this, this happens, right. to make sure that this happens at a reasonable price, just like we did uh, for your phone. You know, it, it wasn't unusual for people not to have a phone until, you know, like the 50s right. because um, they just weren't there. Uh, then you had party lines, but at least somebody had access because we made a, we made a decision as a country to do that. Maybe, well, maybe. You, I think if you just go back three quarters of a century, uh, there were a lot of uh, rural areas, including parts of northern Virginia, that didn't have electricity. That's uh, true. You know, and what you had was the Rural Elect Electrification Administration came in uh, to affect at the national level and really worked to get like, electric access to everybody around the country. Mm -hmm. And so what you're trying to, we're talking about doing here is really not an, a new idea, but an old idea applied to a newer technology and trying to ensure that people have access to services. Uh, absolutely. And I think the, the people that are the businesses and the players that are involved have to be kind of pushed a little bit into it to make sure that, that it's done because if you just leave it up to the free market, it's just not going to happen in a lot of places. Right. If you live in Lebanon, Virginia, or Grundy, or uh, someplace down south, or in, and, and it also affects the poorer areas. Right. Uh, like, for instance, in Fairfax County, the majority of Fairfax County is going to have lots of choices, but there's going to be small areas in Fairfax County where they're going to be the last ones. Yeah. They're going to be semi-red line to where, you know what, after we get everybody that's going to make us money, then maybe we'll put it in there in, in certain areas that maybe are, are not as affluent because obviously the people there might not be able to afford the services um, right away or, you know, it's just not in the business interest to do it right now. Well, it, it may be in some instances relate to the people being able to afford the service and to an economic issue there. But in many instances, it's not. It's actually some of the more affluent areas are areas that are not well served. Uh, you know, this you look at parts true. of Great Falls or Clifton or Fairfax mm -hmm. Station or Lorton, uh, the Mason Neck area. There are some of those areas that don't have access to cable now or that don't have access to DSL services. Uh, you know, those technologies are not available in all areas now. So even in Fairfax County, it's not an insignificant issue. No, and it's and it's still a long way away for those people. Right. Um, you know, building the infrastructure is 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 quite a task. And whether it's a cable company or the telephone company or Verizon, whichever, um, it's not a simple task to do that, and it costs a lot of money. And, and unless they see the return, they don't want to. They don't really want to get too far deeply involved in it. And that's why we, you know, we we still say that you know we can we can have all of the all of the people tap into the universal service fund, right. um, and we can use that money. Uh, we can have subsidization of some sort at the different governmental levels, maybe to help. Um, I think the governor and uh, some of his staff are starting to actually work on this. Uh, Verizon's, um, I mean, CWA's thing is called Speed Matters, and if you go to cwa-union.org, you can click on the Speed Matters campaign, and it gives you an idea of, of how we've actually mapped out a strategy. Uh, CWA, I mean, has mapped out a strategy to, to make this happen, and the first part of it is to map out the areas to find out where we are at this point. Mm -hmm. Who gets what, and how fast it is, and where are the holes? Where are the where are the where are the resources? Where are the holes? Where can we where can we do this? And you know, pick off the low hanging fruit first and get all these people. Uh, in Kentucky, there's a thing called Connect Kentucky, and it's their state campaign to get uh, broadband access to the more rural areas. Right. Uh, do you know roughly uh, what percent of people nationally or what percent of people in Virginia don't have access to any form of uh, broadband technology now? You know, I don't know that, and I was just at hearings down in Richmond with the State Corporation Commission, and I'm not sure anybody's got a really solid figure yeah, on it, to be perfectly idea. honest. Yeah. I think everybody's got their own figure that they think might be correct, but I don't know that anybody really knows for sure. Right. And the cable systems have largely been developed on a jurisdictional or county or city basis in many instances. But then you also have the DSL that's uh, primarily through Verizon in Virginia. Right. 
uh, that is going to be regulated to a certain extent by the State Corporation Commission. Is that correct? Well, actually, the State Corporation Commission only regulates basic dial tone service. This okay. is something a lot of people don't, uh, don't really under, non, uh, realize. Uh, any of this broadband stuff, all the broadband applications are completely not um, yeah, under right. their jurisdiction. Right. Um, uh, but it's, that's the biggest thing on people's minds now. So I don't know if the legislature needs to take this up and say, well, maybe we do need to get the State Corporation Commission involved. In that case, you'll have all of the, all of the businesses saying, no, 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 you know. Um, but we don't think that would necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, we think that the politicians probably do need to get involved, especially the ones in the rural areas, because they have the most to lose. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that one of the issues is sort of when you're in one of those areas that doesn't have access to it, uh, it affects your ability to attract businesses and jobs to those communities. It can affect your, uh, your educational level of your students and their access to certain technology, those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the issues that you hear in terms of why people in some of those areas that aren't served are, are adamant about getting that access? And, you know, that's a great point, and you're absolutely correct in that. You know, if you live in Martinsville and, you know, they've had some hard times. Right. Um, and when those jobs move out and go to Mexico, wherever they go, um, another bad decisions we make sometimes, but if you don't have a good broadband basic infrastructure, nobody's going to move there and take advantage of those hardworking people down there. So what do they have to do? They'll have to move. So at the same time that we're not serving um, the people well, we're also destroying some of, of what people really love about Virginia, some of the, the rural, old-time qualities that it has. If, if you're um, in high school and you want to take college courses, right. well, you can take college courses over the Internet, and you'd only have to go to the college on occasion to meet with the professor or go over your grades or take tests or whatever, and you can do a lot of that work without ever leaving your house. If you have good broadband technologies in your, in, your, in your town, well, maybe instead of commuting to the city every day, maybe you only have to do it twice a week. Yeah. And so now you're not on the road, you're not burning up gas, you're not polluting the atmosphere. So there's so many advantages to this. Um, I mean, you could go on and on. Yeah. Well, one of the things on the educational side that we've heard a lot about is what's called distance learning, uh, where students can have... Uh, whether they are a K through 12 student, someone who's still in, a, in, high, in elementary or high school, or they're an adult who's trying to learn things so that they can get access to uh, college classes or to other types of opportunities, uh, even if you're in a high school that doesn't have some type of specialized pro cert program for, yeah. for that level. Uh, but you can only have access to that if you have the technology to be able to, to give you the, uh, the full benefits of that education. Absolutely. And, and, that's, and even at the high school and grade school level, um, all of those things are available even at that young of an age. Right. Uh, there are plans to try and get the schools and stuff wired in Virginia, but again, that's you know that seems to be a little sporadic and you know sometimes going off track. Right. Well, I've certainly heard a lot about particularly some of the higher education systems trying to to reach out into communities uh, with internet technology to be able to get more students participating who can't easily commute that type of distance to get to a class that's not a, when they're not a full-time student. Right. Uh, so that seems to me certainly at the higher education thing, it's a huge issue and something that could really benefit a lot of those communities where people are not, don't necessarily have the same level of, of college education as people in Fairfax County do. Absolutely. Uh, Couldn't agree with you more. Um, so you, are you hearing a lot from people in rural areas about these types of issues and is that sort of where the major push for this is coming now? Uh, you know, it's everywhere. It's not just the rural areas because it's still sporadic. I mean, I live in Warrington, and um, I can't get DSL. I have to use cable modem. So it's not competition there. I only have one choice. Um, so All right, we need, to, we need to take a break now, but we'll come back and uh, finish this conversation in just a moment. Thank you for being here. History has demonstrated that violence only begets greater violence. And injustice only begets greater injustice. This is not the tradition of our great nation. This is not how we want the United States to be known around the world.
we have another tradition that we think ought to prevail. One that is more just and more powerful. There is a better way. If we truly want peace and security, then we must work hard for justice. If you're concerned that we've become a nation whose national policies are grounded in beliefs that are centered on a line embedded in BS, then don't miss Escape from Orwellian Nation, a talk show in which concerned regular citizens like you and me, not self-serving media spinmeisters, wade through the barrage of newspeak and doublethink that pollutes public discourse today. Big Brother, Big Business, Big Media, and the big national parties who collude to keep we the people afraid and in the dark would prefer that you not watch. Show them who's in charge. Tune in to Escape from Aurelia Nation right here on Channel 10. Welcome back to uh, to our show today. Uh, with me now is Vincent Cody. Uh, we're talking about broadband access on our show, The Inside Scoop, Virginia. We have a question that's been called in from Leo in Fairfax, or uh, emailed in, and it says, ask, will the cable price model infect the net? Uh, don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> All right. Well, Leo, if you could give us a little clarification on that. I think that, I know who Vincent. that is. Uh, 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 the cable price model. No, I don't know about that one. All right. All right. Uh, well, I think maybe talking about sort of the, the fixed prices that are set within different jurisdictions and how that would affect access to uh, whether that type of model oh, for might the prices? be. Yeah, for the prices there. Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. I know that, you know, competition is supposed to uh, drive prices down. Um, but again, what we're talking about is not, we're talking about people just being able to have it, never right. mind the access. price competition. Right. I know that right now in places where Verizon and the cable TV companies are, are competing for your for your dollars on the voice and the data and the video and all that kind of stuff. I know that those prices have, have come down some because they're trying to get you in a package and get everything for right. you. But those are limited. So when that package runs out, I don't know if the price is going to go up or down or if uh, it will continue to compete. But So in those areas so where you have only cable or you have only DSL, you're less likely to have the, the competitive effects there. But where you have multiple options, at least those two, then at least you're going to have some competition between the different groups that are providing services. Yeah, theoretically, that's the way it's supposed to work. Right. But, you know, you never really know for sure. Um, they could all set the same kind of price, you know, like go to the gas station or something, and, and the prices seems to be the same everywhere you go. Um, so then everybody makes some money. But, um, I, you know, I'm not really that concerned about the, the pricing formula at this point in time. Um, I so think if you the get first, the first hurdle is to get everybody access, and then you potentially could deal with other issues right. that, and that they exist at that point. That's that's what I'm worried about at this point. Is you know the the the, the people that do a lot of these jobs are going to be CWA members, right? <clears throat> and so you know that's our that's our selfish parochial interest. But in in the um, in the greater scheme of things, it's just so important. You know I've said it uh, numerous times, but it's so important that people have this ability in this day and age it's 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 not even it doesn't even make sense that we're this far behind at this late time in history right right um, well you talked earlier about how broadband is not regulated by the state corporation commission is that something that the state legislature is looking at doing or is that something that's a possibility uh, that we might get regulation there I would hope that that they would look at this in a broad way and and, and maybe regulate and get all of them to to, uh, to put into the universal service fund or the 911 funds and things, but I don't really see that happening. Not with the legislators, less legislature the way it's now, because they're so bent on having, you know, uh, competition and free market and all that kind of stuff in everything that they do, and that's all great. But it doesn't always work to the best interest of the consumer. Right. I'm curious as to why the legislators from the more rural parts of Virginia that have a bigger problem with this aren't pushing it more aggressively or is that something that some of them are starting to to really to, uh, make a, an issue of now? I think that they're starting to hear noises about it 
the interesting thing is when the original, one of the original issues came down, um, there's a gentleman named Wright. I can't recall his first name. He's Tommy a Republican Wright. Tommy Wright. out of right. Southern Virginia. He was one of the only ones to vote the correct way. Uh -huh. Um, and because he said, because I, I, I went in there and I asked him, I said, how come, you know, you're up on this and nobody else seemed to be? And he said, uh, I'm listening to my people. Right. I'm and uh, respecting so, his people in his district there. Absolutely. So. And, and, and they're starting to get the word. I mean, people are starting to, to, to put two and two together and say, you know, what, what, what these people have been telling me isn't making this any better. Right. So I, th I think they are starting to get it. All right. But they're being pulled along. Okay. Well, maybe that'll happen more. Yeah. All right. We do have a call uh, that's come in now from uh, Dolores from Falls Church. Are you there, Dolores? Hello. No. Hello. Yes, Dolores. Yes, I had a question. What is Virginia doing statewide to try to help get the broadband to everybody? Well, statewide, to be perfectly honest, they're not doing much. They're doing a lot here in Northern Virginia. Um, and they're doing a lot in Fredericksburg, Richmond, basically a 95 corridor, 7 corridor, um, and some of those places. But you get outside of the direct area here, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's mostly in sort of the more urban and metropolitan areas. That, Virginia that, Beach. Right. That yeah. been, the service has been provided now. Uh, and it's not been something, as, as I think you're asking, Dolores, that the state government itself is directly involved. And that's part of what I was talking, uh, my last question to Vincent was, you know, is the state legislature looking at doing something, and particularly our legislators from the rural areas pushing this issue? Well, we're going to encourage them to look at the facts that we have, to show them, give them some ideas as right. to as to what can be done. Um, you know, our Speed Matters campaign with CWA is very detailed in its scope, and um, again, Con Connect Kentucky is what Kentucky has been doing, which is a pretty good starting point and a model. But to answer Dolores' question, if you live somewhere uh, down the road somewhere, it, there's not much being done. Not much being done. No. So it's not as if, not as, not, not compared to what's being done in places like Kentucky or West Virginia where much of the population is, a, is, a rural, is in rural areas and where there's a stronger push for making sure people have access to these Well, services. actually, West Virginia is pitiful in, in a lot of respects. I mean, there's, there's people that aren't, they're not getting anything in West Virginia. Yeah. We've got, a, we've got unfortunately, um, uh, a, something that's just driven by the profits of today, and it's not driven by what's good for the Commonwealth. What's good for everybody. Right. That lives not, in different the parts Commonwealth of and the nation. Right. And, and again, I, I don't know how many times I can repeat that point, but it's, it's really the crux of the matter, is unless we take this on as a country and as a state, right. as a Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, we're not going to, the, the people in the rural areas are not going to get anything for a long, long time. Right. It's just not going to happen until right. they make enough money here to put some more over there. And there needs to be incentives and there needs to be some persuasion and there needs to be some cooperation right. from all the parties, including the CWA and the cable companies and the, and the CLEX and the, and the AT&Ts and the wireless carriers. Everybody could be chipping in that's making money off of you and I every time we talk to right. each other. Right. Well, thank you, Dolores, for calling in. Uh, sorry we got cut off there. If there's anyone else who wishes to call in, please do so. The number is 571-749-1166. And we're talking about broadband access and how we provide that uh, in a more comprehensive fashion in Virginia. Has the governor's office uh, been involved in any discussions about enhancing broadband access statewide? And where do things stand with them right now? Well, they have. Um... Uh, there's a gentleman named Chopra, I can't remember, Anish Chopra. Right. He is the governor's technology assistant person or whatever, I don't know. Cabinet, he's a cabinet secretary. Yeah, yeah. whatever his official right. title right. is. And he's taken uh, the reins here a little bit to put together some parties to discuss the issues and try right. to come up with some, some guidance for the legislature, I guess, and, and to come up with a plan with the governor. But, yeah, they, uh, they have taken some, some steps. They're small steps, and they're 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 in the very beginning stages of taking all this into consideration. But it's starting, and I think I'm I'm relatively optimistic that 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 things will happen in the next couple of years to move this thing along. Right. 
Well, clearly some of the communities that are most affected by lack of access to broadband coverage are some of those in the more rural areas which have suffered economically, that don't have the economic success that we've had in Northern Virginia over the last few decades, and that have the uh, 8, 10, 12 uh, percent unemployment rates in those areas. So it seems as though it would be in the state's interest to try to make sure that people in those areas have this type of access and have all the opportunities to compete for jobs and contracts and those types of things, which can make those uh, communities more economically self-sufficient. I'm 100 percent with you. And like the living wage, I mean, the people that will be hired to put all this stuff into place will be making a good wage and they'll have benefits. Uh, hopefully they'll be CWA members. And, um, and, and that'll be a big shot in the arm for the community. Right. And then along with the building of the infrastructure, of course, come small businesses to support that. Um, and then larger businesses, once it's built and the access is there, they can use the, um, use the technology to employ um, the citizens to do things that maybe they haven't done before. Maybe you were in a farming community and somebody comes in, you know, like an insurance company or something, puts their headquarters there where people answer phones or whatever it might be, I'm not really sure, but um, I just know for sure that if we don't get the, uh, the backbone out there, it's not going to help the jobs. Let's go pull things back to Fairfax County a little bit. Obviously, okay. there are parts of the county that don't have access to every type of technology. I, I happen to live in an area that for many years did not have cable. We now have cable, but we don't have DSL capabilities. Okay. Do you know what the plans are for getting uh, DSL capabilities throughout the county, or is there, are there specific plans to do that? Uh, I don't know about real general specific plans. I know that DSL, if you're too far away from the central office, you can't get it because... Right. Or, or if you have a, your, your box out here, and I'm, I'm not going to get into the technical part of it, it has to be upgraded in order to put the signal to the box, through the fiber, and then send it to your house. And if they don't upgrade that, you're no. probably not getting DSL. Right. Um, there, are other, there are other things that can go out there that you can use, but they're very expensive, T1 lines and things like that. Um, now, when, when Fairfax had their franchise agreement, uh, CWA, we went there and we supported that and spoke for it. Um, and even in the franchise agreement, it doesn't say they're going to cover every single house in the county. Right. I think it's in the 90 percentile or something like that. Um, and I think people out by the quarry maybe are some of them, people that live down Gunston, Gunston Way, I think, right. are some of them. And, um, and I think they'll get that, but I think first what you're going to see is them making make enough profit to cover the cost to set it out there, right. but with public pressure, public pressure and people, you know, writing we'll to whoever, right. you know, the state corporation right. commission, right. you know, they want to hear about it because, right. uh, you know, people are saying that there's Good. competition everywhere and there really isn't. Right. Well, thank you very much, Vincent, for being here today. Uh, thank you, George. Appreciate talking about it. Fun. Uh, I'm a, uh, I was sitting in this seat on the other side recently. I'm a candidate for state senator. If I get elected, please talk to me about these issues. So we Absolutely. Get wider and I, guess, I bet you you'll be getting your broadband soon. That's right. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.